Okay. So last time we talked about um, oh my god, that hurts so bad. We talked about the Schwarzschild solution, and uh, this is the solution outside of any spherically symmetric mass uh, or energy distribution. And we kind of took that and we found the Newtonian limit. And that's an important process because, like I said, general relativity is a generalization of Newtonian gravity. Not special relativity, but Newtonian gravity. So we should be able to extract Newtonian gravity as a limit of general relativity. And we did that last time. But now what we're going to do is we're actually going to be honest and we're going to say, okay, where does that Schwarzschild solution come from? And today we're going to derive it. This will be the only solution that we derive, so that's good. But um, it's gonna be a bit detailed, but there's gonna be a little bit of magic in it. Um, but at any rate, at the end of today's lecture, hopefully, we'll have the interior solution, or sorry, the solution uh, corresponding to a spherically symmetric mass distribution. And next time, we'll talk about the internal solutions. That is, and you're aware of this, if you have a round object that's charged, the exterior solution is really simple. The interior solution depends on the distribution of charge inside. And so what we'll find is the distribution of mass or mass energy inside of a system um, that dictates the form of the solution. But that's important because, and I'll just go ahead and give you a preview, we would like to predict that certain stars must collapse and form black holes. So that's the importance of the next lecture. But for today, we're going to get started on the exterior solution, which is the Schwarzschild. Um, and first of all, um, we're going to start by assuming a spherically symmetric solution coming from a spherically symmetric source. Okay, This is pretty obvious. Although we're going to be a little bit more careful about defining spherically symmetric, because what we're after is the metric, which is a measure of distance. So the, the metric is actually going to be an important thing with many unknowns, which we have to specify. Um, but of course, a spherically symmetric distribution is way easier than an arbitrary distribution. In fact, spherically symmetric distributions are almost the easiest thing you can possibly solve any differential equation for, other than just like planar stuff, OK? So it's easier to find, but obviously this solution is incredibly relevant. Stars, planets, they're all spherically symmetric roughly. So this is the solution outside of a star or planet. Okay, so this is an actually very useful solution. So we're going to warm up with an exercise from electromagnetism, because remember general relativity plays out much like electromagnetism, it's just the equations are a little bit more complicated. But I'm going to start with a warm up from E and M. So consider Gauss's law. All right. And now what we want is a spherically symmetric solution for E in a region where there is no charge density. So we want set rho equals to zero and then find a spherically symmetric solution for E. Okay. Now imagine if you have a charge there and you want to find the electric field outside of that charge, well, if you're outside of the charge, that region has rho equals zero, right? Rho is only non-zero in the presence of the charge, okay? However, you expect that if you have a small point-like charge, or even a big round charge, as long as it's round, the electric field solution will be spherically symmetric. So it makes sense to assume spherical symmetry because we are going to eventually tie this back to a spherically symmetric source. Okay? You could try and work this out in Cartesian coordinates, but the answer would suck. And the work getting it would suck too. Okay? So if we assume a spherically symmetric solution, then basically we can assume that the electric field depends only on the distance r from the center, and it only points in the radial direction. Okay? So this is the assumption of spherical symmetry in solving this problem. All right? And we're also going to assume time independence in this problem, but time independence will be an important factor in, uh, in, in general relativity. Okay, so we've got delta E, and in the 
spherical polar coordinates, of course, del takes a particular form. And the only surviving term is the derivatives with respect to r because derivatives with respect to theta, derivatives with respect to phi, they all vanish because the thing only depends on r. So this is the only non-zero contribution, but this must equal what? Say it again. Zero. Zero, exactly, because we're solving this equation in a region exterior to the source. So rho is zero in that region. Okay? All right. Oh, this is pretty easy to solve. Okay. F of r is k over r squared. And then to interpret what that solution means, we use an old trick. We basically take the integral of del dot e over a three volume. And of course, we integrate the other side as well. OK. Now I'm using this equation because I'm integrating over all space. And that's going to include the space where a row is not 0. Okay. And what we find using the divergence theorem is that this is equal to the integral of e dot dA. And this is q enclosed over epsilon naught. Okay? So if you integrate the charge density over a volume, then you're going to get the charge enclosed. And so this lets us take uh, a spherical shell, in which case the electric field is radial. So that integral is just going to give us 4 pi r squared times the magnitude of e is q enclosed over epsilon naught. And this immediately, of course, tells us that e has a magnitude of q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. OK? So this immediately, of course, tells us k. k is q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon naught. And therefore, of course, e is q enclosed over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared times r half. OK? Should be a review for most of you. OK? Relatively straightforward? OK, so remember we have to do this little step basically to figure out this arbitrary constant. And we'll do a similar procedure at the very end of the spherically symmetric solution in general relativity, but we've got a lot of work to get through to get there. Okay? Now, notice this solution is extremely simple in terms of spherical coordinates. That is not the only coordinate choice that you need to use. It's just by far the simplest. All right, so of course, after you've solved this in the spherical coordinate system, you can take the solution and transform it to any coordinate system after the fact. Okay, because you know how to transform coordinates. You know how to transform vectors and vector coordinate, trans and coordinate transformation. So as long as you can solve it in one coordinate system, you can then take that solution and transform it to any other coordinate system that you like. And that's an important rule for the solution that we're going to get today as well. OK. So turning now to Einstein's equations, things are going to get a little bit scarier, but not that much, actually. Let's start by expressing the source freeness of the region in which we're interested. These are exterior solutions. They're not solutions that are valid inside of an energy or dense mass density source. Okay, these are exterior. So that means that in the region where we're solving, T mu nu is equal to zero. Yeah, T mu nu is the energy momentum tensor. That's the source. So we're trying to find a solution with zero source. Now recall that Einstein's equation takes the form r mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r equals 
a pi g t mu nu. And of course, this means we can set that equal to zero. And that would leave us solving r mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu r equals zero. But we can do better than that. Because you might or might not recall that there is another form of Einstein's equation which we get by taking the trace of each side and then essentially moving a term over to the other side. So the trace reverse form of Einstein's equations becomes r mu nu equals 8 pi g times t mu nu minus 1 half g mu nu times the trace of the energy momentum tensor. Okay? So this is Einstein's equation. This is Einstein's equation in trace reverse form. Okay, why is this advantageous? Okay, I'm gonna ask someone this question. PJ. Yeah. PJ, why is this form of the equation more useful in this scenario than this one? In the first one, we got rid of capital B, and the second one, we keep it so that we can solve the battle of trace constants. Uh, wait, say that again? Capital G? Yeah, in the first one, we just completely get rid of that capital G. What's going to happen to this capital G? What? What's going to happen to this capital G? I figured that the one half G mean is T. What is T? Oh, the trace would be zero. Never mind. I so go ahead and say it. What's this going to be? Zero. Because this is? Zero. Yeah, this is the trace of this. Well, this is zero, so this is zero. So the whole right-hand side is zero. In trace reverse form, Einstein's equation in a vacuum takes that form. I can't ask for a much simpler form of Einstein's equation. I don't even have constants. I don't have 8 pi g to deal with. Boom! OK, anyway. All right, <laughs> this is the vacuum form vacuum form of Einstein's equation. Okay? Now, this is the set of differential equations which we would like to solve, making use of our symmetry. Okay? But of course, first and foremost, we should specify what are the unknowns that we're looking for. Okay? Well, when we're solving Einstein's equation, Paul, Paul, what is the unknown that we're solving Einstein's equation to find? You're given the source, and then you solve Einstein's equation to find what? Normally the metric. Right? The metric, exactly. The metric is largely the unknown. I mean, we could say the Ricci tensor is unknown, but the metric is really the fundamental ingredient. Well, this is a four by four space time, okay? And we're coordinatizing it by T, R, theta, and phi. Okay, so as you might guess, the metric has the unknowns, GTT, GRR, G theta theta, G phi phi, and then the mixed terms GR to T, GR theta, GR phi, and then GT theta, and g theta phi. Okay? All right, 10 unknowns. It's a symmetric 4 by 4 matrix, so you know that, you know, if you know all the off diagonals, you can figure out the other ones because of the symmetry of the metric. So g r t is equal to g t r, so there's no point in writing that down. But we have 10 independent functions. These are all functions. We have 10 functions which we have to solve for. Okay? Now, how many equations does this give? Drew. Uh, okay. It's going to give you 10 equations. 16. <laughs> 10 or 16. Uh, is, the, is the Ritchie tensor symmetric under the exchange of the two lower indices? It is, yeah. So it'll give us 10 independent equations. Okay? Well, that seems nice. It actually isn't that simple, but it, it looks like it's, it's good. 10 equations, 10 unknowns. All right. 
Now, we are going to use spherical polar coordinates to assume spherical symmetry. However, we are not going to end up getting our solution in terms of these coordinates. Now, the reason for that is that these coordinates, as they are normally defined, are really helpful on flat space. You take R4, or Minkowski's, four-dimensional Minkowski space, and you write it in terms of these spherical polar coordinates, and everything is nicely defined. However, this solution is going to correspond to a curved geometry. There is no reason to expect that the curved geometry will be useful in, in using exactly the same coordinates by definition. Okay? So we will use various coordinate redefinitions. We're going to use them extensively, actually. Okay? So I just want you to bear in mind, I'm going to start with this, but I'm going to make coordinate redefinitions as we go. All right? And that's, and that's almost expected because you're not solving for a flat space geometry. We're solving for a curved geometry. Okay. So, of course, spherical symmetry, when we imply it, is going to have quite a bit to say about these functions. Okay? So let's go ahead and talk about what spherical symmetry is going to do for us. Um, okay. So one way to build up spherical symmetry is, of course, we take an origin for the radial coordinate. And then what we can do is we can imagine <coughs> A, a construction called a foliation of the geometry, okay? And for a spherically symmetric foliation, what we have in mind is that we pick this radial point in space, and then we surround it by a bunch of two spheres in space, okay? All right? Spheres are stacked along the radial coordinate in terms of the spatial geometry, okay? But it turns out that along the time coordinate, the spheres are stacked in this way. If you pick a sphere, Okay, so now I'm going to pick a fixed, so here I pick a fixed time, and then I ask, how is the spherical exfoliation going with a radial coordinate? So as you go out in radius, the spherical radius gets larger. Okay. Now I want to fix, of course I have to freeze time because this is hard to draw a four-dimensional picture. So for this one I freeze time, for this one I freeze the radius, and then I let t evolve. So all of my spheres are now going to have the same radius, but they're going to appear at different times. And in that case, the stacking goes like this. Okay? Now, let's go ahead and make some simplifications. So uh, if we focus on a two-sphere, so if we just take a single two-sphere with fixed R and T, okay, then we can actually guess what the metric on that two sphere should look like, okay? The metric on the two sphere should just be d omega squared is d theta squared plus sine squared theta d t squared, Okay, where this is just the angular contribution, you know that in the full metric you'd multiply that by a radial factor. Okay, but right now I'm just talking about the metric subtended by the angles theta and phi. Okay? So if we take this as our metric on a single two sphere, and then we imagine that in the spatial direction, the radial spatial direction, the spheres are just stacked in an ever enlarging radius, and then in the t direction, they're just stacked in a you know array of constant radials. 
If this is the metric on each and every one of these, then this immediately tells us that there is no cross term between theta and phi. Okay? Because a cross term between theta and phi would be something like this. If I want to form the, the invariant distance, the ds squared, given that the, I'll just do ds, given that the coordinates are x and y, then to form ds squared, I have to take the metric. So if I do the identity, then this just becomes dx squared plus dy squared. Okay? However, if I do off-diagonal terms, what happens? Do you have cross terms for the dx squared too? Yeah, I get cross terms because this is going to give me a dy in the upper and then I'm going to multiply that by the dx, so it's going to give me two dx dy. Okay? So this is what I would recognize as the gxy term, this is the gyy term, and this is the gxx term, where I have gxx, GYY, GXY, GYX. Does that make sense to everyone? I just want to make sure. Okay, metrics we think of as matrices, but now we're thinking of them as the, their individual elements. But nonetheless, this two-dimensional metric has no d theta d phi terms, so the g theta g phi term of the metric is zero. So we can knock one of these out. Boom! We're going to make use of that quite a bit. Okay? But does everyone understand that? Because I'm going to beat the crap out of that idea. Okay, good. Well, let's take this guy and let's imagine, and let me maybe blow it up a little bit to make it make more sense. Now imagine I have a theta and phi describing this sphere, and then I have a different theta prime and a different phi prime describing this sphere, okay? A priori, there's really no need, actually, <laughs> to align this theta phi with this theta prime phi prime. I can take this coordinate system and rotate it with respect to this one. Do we want to do that? Hell no, okay? But that is a flexibility. All right. If we do, however, coordinate it so that this point is at the value theta phi on this spherical, spherical shell, and it's at the exact same values of theta and phi on this point, okay, then this assumption that we align the angular coordinates of the spherical shells gets rid of some of the terms as well. Annabelle, which of these terms do you think that gets rid of? Exactly, okay? So this is going to get rid of the R theta and the R phi terms. So I guess I'm going to excess through them. Okay, if I wanted to change the relative orientation of these surfaces, then I could do that with a metric which has non-zero r theta and r phi terms. Okay, but if I align it, which I'm obviously going to do, then that's going to force the r theta and the r phi terms to vanish. Okay? All right. Here we go. What do you think we're going to do here? Any guesses? This is the stacking of spheres along T. Andrew, uh -huh. what are we going to do here? Same thing. The exact same thing. A 
Okay, we've got a theta and a phi coordinate system for this guy. Remember, this is only defined for a single spherical shell. And then every spherical shell gets one of these metrics. And we're just talking about the alignment of the different spherical shells. So here, if I make sure that this point is given by theta and phi in this coordinate system, and it's given by the same theta and phi in this coordinate system, then that means we're aligning the spheres along the time evolution. Andrew, which terms do you think that'll get rid of? Exactly, that'll get rid of P theta and P phi. Okay? Everybody following? So by, build, by building our space through this sort of reasonably intelligent process, we're getting rid of a lot of possible terms in the metric. Okay? All right. Well, let's see what we can write down for the metric so far. It'll change the d phi or the d, the d theta. By nine. Exactly. So the d phi, d theta, r theta, so you don't have to. Exactly. There you go. OK. So like, like Bill just said, if I take a different coordinate system here than here, changing the value of r means I'm also going to change the value of theta or phi, depending on which one I rotate about. And that change is measured by g r theta, g r phi. We're setting that to zero because we're aligning everything. So now I can change my value of r, and I'll have the same value of theta and phi. OK? All right, so let's write down what we've got for our fiducial form of the metric so far. We have minus a r t d t squared plus 2 d R T D R D T plus C R T D R squared. you to notice that these two forms of the metric tensor are not completely independent. We know, relatively speaking, what the coefficient of g, or what g theta theta and g phi phi is like. We can have an overall factor, which is still undetermined, okay? But this is essentially hybridizing this into one, into one unknown, which we're calling d. But otherwise, A is GTT, 2B is GRR, and the function C, or sorry, 2B is GRT, and then C, the unknown function C, is GRR. Okay? And don't worry why we picked a factor of 2. Uh, Carol's actually a little bit more careful about this. Technically, we should write this as DRDT plus DTDR. Okay, but we're not going to worry about that. It'll all play out in our analysis, so I'm not even going to go there. But the, the factor of two is just convenient for that description. OK. All right. So now we have four unknown functions. It's not bad, because we started out with 10 unknown functions. And we reduced it to four, this one, this one, this one, and then this hybrid one by the function d. Notice the functions only have dependence on r and t. Okay? The angular dependence is completely soaked up in this definition right here. Okay? I mean, if 
you think about it, spherical symmetry is that it doesn't depend on theta and phi. The answer doesn't depend on theta and phi. Okay? Now, it turns out that we can do a little bit better with a trick which we will use rather regularly. <coughs> Suppose that I redefine the radial coordinate in the following form. I take the R coordinate in here and I multiply it by the square root of this unknown function D. And I use that to define a new R coordinate I'll call R prime. It's just a coordinate redefinition. Okay. Now we can invert this. Frank. Go ahead. Okay, long story. We can invert this to find r as a function of r prime and t. Okay? You can imagine inverting this to find r as a function of r prime and t. And then we can insert this into our metric. And what we'll essentially get is the following. Everywhere I see r in here, I'm going to replace it with this function of r prime and t. But that means that a function of r and t is going to be a function of r prime and t, where it might be a new functional form. Okay. All I'm doing is I'm taking the solution to inverting this to get this, and I'm plugging it in for r everywhere. Now this thing depends on t, so we can also change the time dependence. So we can change the functional form of a. So that's why I'm putting a prime on A, and of course it's going to depend on R prime. And then it's going to give me a B prime and an R prime, a C prime and an R prime. But guess what it's going to do the last term? Any takers? It should get rid of the R squared, right? No. Oh, get rid of the D. It should get rid of the D? Yeah, it'll get rid of the D. There you go. So this coordinate redefinition, which we do in terms of a function we don't yet know, reduces the total number of unknowns from four to three. But now here's the glorious thing. Why don't we just work in this set of coordinates? Why don't we just work in the set of coordinates defined by r prime and t? That is, why don't we just call this R? And since these are unknown functions, who needs to label them with a prime? Now, did that step scare you? Because we're going to use it a couple more times. It is a non-trivial relationship between the coordinates we had written this in and the new coordinates we've written it in, okay? But it is a step that we could take if we had actually solved for this D function. But we can assume that we took that step, and in these new coordinates, this is the form of the metric, yes? So why do we switch the R in all of the functions and then leave the R the same? Uh, so why did we make this R prime? Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. It should be dr prime. Okay. Sorry, yeah, you're right. It should have been dr prime. My bad. Okay? Now, this kind of change is very similar to a change you often make if you're solving Maxwell's equations for A and phi, the vector and scalar potential. Okay? You write down Maxwell's equations, and you want to find the scalar potential and the vector potential. And then at a certain point, you're like, yeah, I kind of think if we do this, if we define this, it'll make things easier. That's called picking the gauge. You set the gauge to the Lorentz gauge, then solving the 
the equations can be simpler. Set to the Coulomb gauge, solving the equations can be simpler. This is just a gauge choice. The gauge freedom of general relativity is coordinate choice. So we're just utilizing the gauge freedom to simplify our solution. The solution to this equation, the functions a, b, and c, are going to be a solution that is related to the other solution, which involved this function d, through a gauge transformation. But who cares? Now, that might not sit completely square with you, but I am going to bring that te technique back several times. Okay, so now we can go a little bit further. <clears throat> so we can use that gauge freedom to do even more. And I don't know if you not being comfortable with it means that you're gonna be less and less comfortable the more I use it, or perhaps the more I use it, you'll be like, oh, I kinda of see. Right. Well, we're gonna hope for case B, but just in case. Okay, so, taking this expression, which is now how we're gonna treat this, with three unknown functions, we can make another coordinate redefinition. We can take T, and we can redefine it in terms of some new time t prime, which is t minus a function r t prime, okay? And then of course, this immediately tells me that t is t prime plus f of r t prime. And then we can take this and we can, and we can calculate the coordinate differential. dt is, of course, going to be dt prime. And I'm using this expression right here, dt prime plus partial f, partial r, dr, plus partial f, partial t prime, dt prime. Okay. I'm just using a coordinate transformation to transform this coordinate differential. Sense? Anybody uncomfortable with that? Okay. So I can write this in a clean form. Df dr dr plus 1 plus df dt prime times dt prime because I have to square it. That's just a rearrangement. But now if I square it, what I get is df dt squared, dr squared, this is term squared, plus two df dr, this is a cross term, one plus df dt prime, dr dt prime, plus one plus partial f partial t prime squared, dt prime squared. Okay? So all I've done is I've taken my time, I've redefined it through a coordinate transformation, I've calculated dt and then dt squared, and then what we can do is we can utilize this in this metric. All right? So if I put this back into the metric, I'm gonna get the following. Minus a r t prime, times the quantity df dr squared dr squared plus one plus df dt prime squared dt prime squared. If you guys have any jokes you can tell while I'm writing all this up, go ahead and tell them. Normally students don't have jokes, so I don't even know why I ask. But you know, it gives me something to talk about, criticizing you all for not having jokes. Anyway. Why are your crickets crooked? Why? To get good service. Oh boy. I like it. I think. We're almost there. Thank you so much.
much for the job. Okay. Did you hear about the shots I think that's the present? No. Yeah, they said it was a small medium and a large. <laughs> oh, I like it. I like it. Okay, what am I going to do? I am going to collect all of the terms here that have BRDT prime as factors. So that's going to be this term with a minus A and this term with this and a 2B, okay? If I do that, then what I find is the following, 2 times minus A R T prime, BF dr plus B R T prime times the quantity 1 plus B F D T prime, D R D T prime, Okay? This is the next term in the metric that corresponds to this guy in terms of this new t coordinate. Okay? Now what we can do is we can say, hey, is it possible to choose the function f such that this is zero? And of course we can if df dr is b r t prime over a r t prime. Okay? Then clearly this term is going to vanish. And what this means is in this new set of coordinates, okay, where I'm replacing the t with the t prime defined there, the metric can have zero for the cross radial and time term if I use as my function f one that satisfies this. Okay? And of course this is pretty straightforward to do. f of r and t prime is just going to be the integral of br t prime over a of r t prime plus some function of purely gt prime. Okay? So now what we can do is we can say, okay, if I redefine my time coordinate using a function f in the definition, the core degree definition here that satisfies this, then my metric simplifies to the following form. Minus that, no, I'm have to write it. I'll write it down here. My metric is going to become minus a r t prime one plus partial f partial t prime squared d t prime squared plus minus a r t prime times b r t prime over a r t prime quantity squared plus q b r t prime times b r t prime over a r t prime and I'm just plugging in this unknown function f plus C R T prime times D R squared plus R squared D omega squared. This is, of course, in a new coordinate system using the time coordinate t prime, which is defined here using this function f, which satisfies this condition. Okay? But if we take this to be the new coordinate system we're using, and we just say these are the coordinates we're going to use, then I don't need the prime. I'll just call it t. Okay? 
So there's no point in having a prime on my keys. Okay. Now I want you to notice that this metric is essentially GTT RT DT squared. plus G, oops, DT squared, GRR of R and T, the R squared, plus R squared, the omega squared. Who can tell me what's so nice about that metric? Diagonal. It's diagonal. It only has four terms. That was the point of eliminating the cross term, the RT cross term. So now we're able to describe the geometry in terms of a purely diagonal metric. That is not something that we necessarily expected from the beginning. Okay? Moreover, there are essentially two unknown functions. Okay, you can encode them in this manner but f is related to a and b, so really there's only two functions in here which need to be determined. But we can say even more about these by using the following argument. Man, this is just so sweet. Do you know why this is sweet, that we're cutting down all the work that we have to do? Can anybody guess? What have we not used yet? Go ahead and say it. I was going to say you already used the R mu mu zero. Yeah, you're saying the same thing. I haven't used the I haven't used the equation I'm telling you. I'm purely using spherical symmetry. It has cut down ten unknown functions to two unknown functions of two variables. That's pretty sweet. Okay. And it gets even better. Eventually, we will roll out the R mu mu equals zero. But you can imagine that r mu nu equals zero with all of these as unknowns is going to be a hell of a set of couple differential equations. But we don't have to use all these as unknowns. We can use these as our unknown functions. And that should tell you immediately that many terms in r mu nu are automatically going to be zero. It's pretty sweet, okay? But we can actually do a little bit better. And then we'll turn to the r mu equals zero. So first of all, in our original analysis, a of rt and c of rt were greater than zero. Okay, this was the assumption that we have a Lorentzian signature metric. That is that the term in front of dt squared is negative, and the term in front of dr squared is positive. So remember, Minkowski space has a metric minus one, 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 one in Cartesian coordinates, okay? And I said a Lorentzian space is one that can use any coordinates, but it will still satisfy that the upper leftmost term is negative and the rest of the diagonals are positive. That's what Lorentzian means. So you can take Minkowski space and transform it to any coordinate system you like. The upper left term is still going to be negative with respect to the rest of the diagonals. Okay, so this is just the condition that this unknown function A is positive and this unknown function C is positive. Okay, now we can conclude that GTT is less than zero. Okay, and then GRR, which is equal to minus, and so we can conclude that the TT term, so I'm looking at this form of this, the term in front of DT squared is minus A times something which is squared. So this is positive, that's a minus, so as long as this is positive, that TT term in the metric is gonna be negative, okay? In order to get this term in front of DR squared to 
be positive, we need all of this to give us a positive answer. So that's, of course, minus b squared over a plus 2, b squared over a plus c, which is b squared over a plus c. We need that to be positive, okay? And it works. Because a is positive, c is positive, and of course b squared is positive. Notice we don't have to make any assumption about the sign of b. b could be a positive or a negative function. It doesn't matter. Because that'll, no matter what the sign of b is, we're squaring it here in order to find the coefficient in front of brr, br squared. Okay? So the reason we do this is because now what we can do is instead of writing our unknown functions like this, we can write them in a form that encodes this signage. So I would like to write down the coefficient here such that no matter what the solutions for the functions are, the coefficient is negative. So what we can do is we can say if GTT is minus e to the 2 alpha of r and t, then it doesn't matter what the function alpha is, that's going to be negative. Similarly, GRR, which I want to be positive, can just be e to the 2 beta of r and t. Writing the unknowns in terms of exponentials guarantees the sign. We don't have to worry about, oh, I've got to make sure that it's, the GTT term is negative and the GRR term is positive. This is guaranteeing it. So what we can do is we can use this as our unknown functions. Okay? All right. So henceforth, I will refer to the unknown functions as alpha and beta instead of GTT, GRR, or A, B, C, okay? I'm just gonna think of alpha and beta as the unknown functions that I'm trying to solve for. Now it is time to put the Ricci equation, r mu equals zero to use. If you haven't touched it yet, now's the time, okay? So let me clean this up a bit. Write down where metric now lies. So our metric is now minus e to the 2 alpha of r and t dt squared plus e to the 2 beta of r and t dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay? Or again, writing things in terms of these exponentials is just enforcing the signs of these terms that we know have to be preserved. Okay. So now, if we want to do the R mu nu term, as you might have guessed, many, many parts of R mu nu are zero, but some are not, and the ones that are not automatically zero are the ones from which we can actually get some useful work. So let me write down the list of things which are not zero. So R T T, R R R, R T R, R theta theta, and R phi phi. Okay, these are the non-trivial terms in the Ricci tensor. Now, of course, to make sure that the metric satisfies this condition, we can force all of these to be equal to zero, but they're not trivially zero, so each of these being zero will give us an equation that we have to make sure our solution solves. Does this make sense? Okay, the rest of the terms for R mu mu are automatically zero, so setting them to zero doesn't really do anything. Okay? All right, so here we go. Let's consider first, and of course, you know, you can take Mathematica, cram this metric into it, and ask it what are the Ricci tensor components, and you get the expressions that I'm going to write down. Now, what I'm going to do in the process is I'm going to take a component of this, I'm going to use it to further simplify the metric, 
And then, when I want to continue further, I use the new form of the metric to find the Ritchie tensor components. And then I solve those equations. So I'm always using a different set of Ritchie tensor components as I use each term to simplify the form of the metric. Okay? So if I start with this RTR term, this says 2R over D beta partial beta partial T of course equals zero. What does this tell me? Yeah, this tells me that beta is independent of t. So this tells me that beta rt is really just beta r. Okay? That's pretty nice. Then I can take this assumption that beta is only a function of r, and I can ask, okay, now what does the r theta theta term now look like? It would look different if I were including the time dependence, but I don't need to because it's independent of time. So the R theta theta term gives me e to the minus 2 beta. And of course, these are terms which, you know, you have to use Mathematica to find. So these are not obvious things that I'm writing down. R theta theta term gives me an expression like that. And then, of course, I can, if I want to, and by the way, nothing that I'm doing is obvious. It took, took the smartest guys a while to find this solution. So, you know, they, it took them more than an hour and 15 minutes. I guarantee you. So don't fret if these stats are like, wow, why did they do that? <laughs> if I take the partial derivative of this with respect to time, I get minus 2 d beta dt e to the minus 2 beta times all this stuff in here plus e to the minus 2 beta r d2 beta dt dr minus r d2 alpha dt dr equals 0. Okay? Can anybody tell me what in there is 0? The first term is zero because the beta dt is zero. What about the second term? The first part of the second term? Yeah, the first part of the second term is zero because this is d2 beta dt dr. Well, beta doesn't depend on t, so this is zero. Okay? So what this becomes is basically minus r e to the 2 minus beta dt dr of alpha rt equals zero, okay? Now these terms are not zero. So in order for this thing to be zero, these derivatives have to be zero. And that tells me immediately that alpha of r and t is a function of r plus a function of t. Does that make sense? Does, this, does it make sense that this is a natural solution to the mixed derivative equals zero? Okay. Then this tells us that ds squared is now minus e to the 2 f of r e to the 2 g of t dt squared plus e to the 2 beta of r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay? Okay? All I did was I took this alpha function and I broke it up into the sum of f and g, and then the exponentials, they break up. Okay? So here's the nice thing. That, a function of time times dt squared, that's begging for a four-door redefinition. So let's do it, okay? So if I take t and I send it to t prime, 
which is the integral of e to the gt dt, then this tells me that dt prime is just e to the gt dt. So this means that ds squared in terms of the t prime coordinate is now e to the 2 f of r dt prime squared plus e to the 2 beta of r dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. That is the time dependence of the metric terms I can get rid of by a coordinate redefinition. The only functional dependence in all of these metric terms that are unknown is radial dependence. Okay? This is rather powerful. In fact, what this leads to is the idea that this geometry in these coordinates, okay, this geometry is called stationary. Stationary means it's not changing in time. There's no time dependence here. I mean, dt prime is a time interval, but that's just measuring you know, the distance associated with the time interval. The functional form of the metric has no time independence. So that means that if I consider this geometry at this moment, and then I consider the geometry at this moment, the geometries look identical. There's no time evolution in the geometry. Okay? Now this is called stationary, but it turns out this geometry is even better. This geometry is static. Stationary versus static. Anybody have any guesses? Suppose that something was spinning at a constant rate. So it's not speeding up or slowing down. Is that stationary? Would it look the same in the future? Yes. However, what if I reverse time? Does that change the geometry? If I reverse time, then it spins in the opposite direction. Does that change the dt then? Yeah, yeah, no, no, it would change the dt. It would change dt to minus dt. So if something is spinning, it can be stationary the same throughout all time, but if I reverse the direction of time, the motion changes. What about something which is just sitting dead still? Is it stationary? Yes. Is it static? Yes. If I change time, it just still sits there. Well, how do I identify whether my, if my geometry is static or not? Stationary just means it doesn't depend on time explicitly. How do I figure out whether it's static? And you have the answer, actually. What would I need in my metric in order to pick up a minus sign if I change the direction of time? A non-diagonal term? Exactly, I would need a non-diagonal term. I would need something like dr dt, because then when I change time, this picks up a negative sign. But since this term doesn't exist, all I have is dt squared, this thing is static. Later in the, in the course, we will consider a spinning solution that is stationary, but not static. And as you might expect, the spinning solution will have a non-zero term for drdt. Okay? So this geometry is super nice. Um, and I, we might be able to get to the end. So, again, well, hold on a second. Shit. What did we assume? What was the assumption that we made before we started solving this? Spherical symmetry and t mu equals zero. T mu equals zero and spherical symmetry. However, what we just determined is that in a particular coordinate system, the solution is time independent. We did not 
assume the time independence of our solution, we found it. Okay, that's rather interesting. All right, so let me carry on to finish this up. So we're gonna take a couple of more pieces of our uh, Ritchie tensor and bang out some final results, and I'll just rush through these quickly because we're almost near the end. So if I take the RTT term, then this is going to be e to the 2 f minus beta times the quantity d2 f d r squared plus d f d r squared minus d f d r d beta d r plus 2 over r d beta d r. And this is equal to 0, of course. Once again, and of course this is utilizing this form of the metric now, the simplest form, okay? So going back, this is the form of RTT. Of course, if this is zero, this term can be zero, so that means that this term is zero. All right? If I also write down the RR term, then I get minus D2 F dr squared minus partial f partial r squared plus df dr d beta dr plus 2 over r d beta dr. That has to be equal to 0. Okay? But what I can do is I can take the term here, which I said was equal to 0, and I can add to it this term. Of course, each of these are zero, so the sum is zero plus zero equals zero. zero. zero thank you. But if I write it in terms of what these things are, this is two over r, partial f partial r plus partial beta partial r equals zero, which of course tells me that these two terms must cancel. Df dr is minus d beta dr which of course tells me that f of r is minus beta of r plus some constant c, okay? <clears throat> then what that means is that I can write this as minus beta, okay? There would be an e to the 2c if we included this as part of our solution, but an e to the 2c is just a constant term which I can get rid of by redefining the two prime coordinate. So we're not even gonna mess with it, okay? So now we're getting a little bit smoother and quicker in our coordinate redefinitions, getting rid of things. Okay? And then finally, if I take this form of the expression, and I calculate the r theta theta term, this is going to give me e to the 2f, which I'll do it with f instead of beta, but we can do it either way, is minus 2r df dr minus 1 plus 1 equals 0, or another way to write this is d by dr of r e to the 2f equals 1, which tells me that r e to the 2f is equal to r plus c, or e to the 2f is equal to 1 plus c over r. Of course, now if I do this in terms of beta, e to the 2 beta, becomes 1 plus c over r to the minus 1. Okay. E to the 2f is just e to the minus 2 beta. They're the same thing. That's what we just argued. Okay, so our metric is going to end up taking the following lovely form, that ds squared, and this is in the appropriate set of coordinates, is equal to minus 
1 plus c over r dt squared plus 1 plus c over r to the minus 1 dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. Okay? And now all we have to do is reflect on what we did in class last time. Last time, when we wanted to connect the Schwarzschild solution to the Newtonian limit, we had at the last moment to make an identification. And that identification was that G00, that's the time component of the metric, which in that case was minus 1 plus 2 phi, we basically said in order for this to give us the Newtonian limit, phi has to be minus gm over r. Okay? So now we can make that identification here, and this is going to become minus 1 minus 2gm, 1 minus and there you have it. That's the Schwarzschild metric that we started our last lecture with. Asymptotically, what is the geometry? If you go far, far away from the source, take R to infinity, what's the geometry? Mm. It's flat space. Because this term disappears, so I get minus dt squared plus dr squared plus r squared d omega squared. I'm just describing flat space in terms of spherical polar coordinates. That's to be expected. Now, you're going to get a homework on this. <coughs> that is not necessary. We secretly made an implicit assumption that if you go far, far away, you're going to asymptote to flat space. You could say, if I go far, far away, I asymptote to de Sitter space or anti-de Sitter space. Those are the maximally symmetric spaces whose curvature is defined by a single number. Okay? I'm going to let you do this on your homework. I'm going to let you go through this derivation that used asymptotically de Sitter or anti de Sitter. Okay? It's only going to change one thing. Almost everything else is going to go exactly the same. First and foremost, it doesn't change your assumption of spherical symmetry at all. The only thing that it changes is this equation. Okay? And it changes it in a very, very simple form. All right. So that is what we have for today. Once again, this is the solution outside of any spherically symmetric energy momentum distribution. The time independence is just a bonus. We didn't assume it, it just came along for the ride. That is, of course, working in this particular coordinate system. Once again, this is called the Schwarzschild metric in Schwarzschild coordinates. We will look at changing the coordinates. We won't need to in terms of a large rigid thing, but in studying a black hole, it's going to be very profitable to change the coordinates to describe this solution. So we'll get there, okay? But like I said, next time we meet, we're actually gonna look at the interior form of this solution. That's gonna be a bit of a headache, but it is eventually gonna to lead to the proposition that things can collapse, and when they collapse, they're going to collapse to a black hole. So we're going to predict the existence of black holes. More on that next time. We don't have homework due on Thursday. No, you do not have homework due on Thursday.